Now, uh, reading number seven. Um, now, l let's have a look at the, the name of the reading. There are two major sections in this reading. Interestingly, number of times students only focus on the first section, and that is statistical concepts. As you can see very, very clearly, that <clears throat> there is another section, market returns. So when you are preparing for exam, make sure that you do not give your like 90% of time to this statistical concepts and 10% time to market return. No, you should obviously spend uh, time in, uh, on both topics. A um, lot of it is, is review of basic um, statistics. For example, what is a population? Population is a term that refers to, uh, for example, um, there are 2 million financial analysts in the world. So if you want to understand about these analysts, um, this, this group of analysts will be our population. Clearly, for example, if you want to know what is the average age of financial analysts, we cannot learn about 2 million people. The way we are going to do that is we are going to do sampling. We are going to select few people, let's say 10,000 or 5,000 or 100 or whatever, 500. And based on that, we'll say, look, we have looked at 500 financial analysts, and on average, their age was 36. So that is our sample, the sample of 500 financial analysts. And the data that we got of 500 analysts is being used to uh, make a conclusion about population of 2 million financial analysts. And we are not talking about their height. We are not talking about their weight. We are talking about a specific number and that is age, average age of financial analysts. These numbers are called parameters related to population. For example, average age of financial analyst, average height of financial analyst, average ethnicity of financial analyst, average years of education of financial analyst. So these are parameters. So very simple, the, the average age in the sample was a sample statistic that was used to infer a parameter of the population. So we looked at a sample of 500 analysts, their average age was 36. So we are assuming that the average age of the whole population is 36 as well. So sample and a number related to sample is sample statistic, like average age of uh, analyst in the sample. And population and a, and a number related to the population is called parameter, like average age of every financial analyst. Now, mostly we are, uh, obviously we are studying from finance perspective, we're going to work with stocks. When I looked at my uh, US account first time, I wanted to invest in stocks, I said, okay, I want to invest in stocks. I do not want to invest in bonds, I do not want to invest in stocks. And the system said, okay, this is the list available, total number of stocks available for investment, 60,000 plus, 60,000. Um, obviously, it was very difficult for me to know which one to invest in. Uh, so that 60,000 is the whole population of stocks that are available to invest. And for example, I wanted to know what is their average uh, sales. Now, that can be done for 60,000 or it could be done for a sample. So a lot of time we work with samples because it is difficult to work with the whole population. As you are going to see in detail. Now, statistic is simply... Uh, most of the we are going to use it as, as a term that refers to data. For example, your uh, age is a statistic. For example, your uh, uh, house location is a statistic. For example, your uh, number of years of education is a statistic. Though sometimes statistic is also used for methods, for ways to do things. But mostly we are going to focus on statistic as a term. As uh, So for example, uh, how are your statistics uh, of your uh, uh, test scores? So what I'm saying is, how much you have been scoring in tests? So statistics referring to data. More sophisticated way of talking about data. If we are talking about data of the population, then these are called descriptive statistics. If we are talking about data of the sample, then these are called inferential statistics. So let's try a question. Average age of all financial analysts is a descriptive statistic, descriptive data, because it is describing the whole population. Average age of analysts in a sample is a inferential statistic, because we use it to infer. Infer means to predict, to forecast. 
So we look at the sample age and we try to use it to infer. For example, if I want to know what is average age of CFA candidates in Lahore. I want to know that what is average age of CFA candidates in Lahore. Right now, the CFA candidates in Lahore would be my sample or my population? population. That is my population. That's all I want to know about. I, that's all I want to know about. But for, I do not have access to all CFA students in law. Let's say I select you as a sample. Now you are not all CFA students in law, but many others. But you are a part of that. You are a sample. Now if I look at your average age, that, and I use that to infer the average age of CFA candidates in the hall. But I am doing, I am looking at a sample, I am calculating your average age, which is a sample statistic, which I am using to infer to estimate, infer another term of that is estimate, to estimate age of CFA candidates in Lahore. So that's why your average age, which is the inferential statistic, uh, which is used to infer, infer refers to estimate. Now, this is uh, a very interesting uh, uh, scaling. A lot of time we need to organize data. For example, scaling is everywhere. For example, uh, uh, CFA level 3 candidate versus level 2 candidate versus level 1 candidate. So when I am teaching class, a student is sitting here, so if either you belong to level 3, level 2 or level 1. What I am doing? I am ranking. I am scaling. Scaling, and another word of that, another word of that is uh, ranking. You rank. You try to organize. You try to divide. Into. For example, uh, commission officers and non-commissioned officers. What are we doing? We are again organizing. Uh, graduates versus uh, uh, undergraduates, again organizing. Uh, Asians versus Africa, organizing. So there are various ways to organize data. Now clearly you can understand if I organize data into, uh, for example, candidates of uh, uh, level 1 uh, versus candidate of level 2 uh, versus candidate of level 3. Clearly you can do some uh, uh, you can you can say a few things about this. For example, you can say that a candidate of this third category sees a candidate, a, a member of the third category is uh, more educated than member of A or B category. How we know that? Because in order to in, be in category 3, you have to first be in A and then B and then C. We can in fact bring some order. We can say uh, this is the most educated, the mid educated and the least educated, right? So we can create an order. But on the other side, let's say if I try to divide candidates, CFA candidates into three groups and these are uh, 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 Asians, uh, Americans and uh, Europeans. European. Now, can I order these in a way? Probably not. I can do not know which one is more qualified or less qualified. The, yes, there are three different groups, but I cannot I cannot say in descending order or ascending order. So that's where you have this. If you organize CFA students into Asian, American, and European, that's a nominal scale. You cannot even bring any order into it. But if you organize into level 1, level 2 and level 3, you are bringing order. So that's why it's ordinal scale, scaling or ranking. So make sure that you understand the difference. So if, for example, I, I divide birds into a few categories, I divide birds into uh, beautiful birds, birds who are hunt, birds who walk, is it ordinal scaling or uh, not? Is there any order in, these, in this grouping? No, there is no order. So this would be a type of nominal scale versus ordinal scale. If there is order, then it is ordinal scaling. But rarely we deal with these two. In fact, most of the time we are going to deal with this. This is the most common present in finance world, ratio scale. Um, mostly when you rank things, they are in ratio scale. So this is the default. If in exam you are, you are not able to answer a question, because you are mixing things, go with this, ratio scale. This is the most common way of scaling things. Let me give you an example of that. So, for example, if I say that uh, uh, interest rates are 10% in Pakistan, let's say interest rates are 10%. 
while in US, interest rates are 1%. Now, I have just ranked these two data points, interest rate, two countries with their interest rate. Is there order? Yes. Pakistan interest rates are above US interest rate. There is an order. But this is, this is something more than order. Not only we can say that Pakistan interest rates are more than US interest rates. We can also identify how much more in terms of times. So we can say that Pakistan interest rates are 10 times more than US interest rates. So we can give a ratio. We can say that the ratio of Pakistan interest rate to US interest rate is 10. That's why it's called ratio scale. Let's try another one. Let's say we have uh, 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 A and B and C. A's height is uh, 6 feet. 6 feet. B's height is 5.5 feet. And C's height is 5.2. Now clearly we can see that there is an order. A is taller than B, which is taller than C. Is it... Is this scaling based on some ratio? There is a ratio. What is the ratio? Ratio is, we can say that uh, uh, Mr. A is uh, six times of uh, someone who owes of one feet. Or in this case, you can divide six by 5.2 and you can get a ratio that is the defined the A's height versus the C's height. So, if I ask you that A's height is how much above C in terms of percentage, you can calculate 6 divided by 5.2, that will give you the percentage higher height. You can do that calculation. If you can do this type of calculation, then this is ratio scale. Now mostly, when we'll be dealing with this, we'll be able to do these calculations. Let's try another one. Let's say a fund has a return of 12%. Fund A. There is another fund that has has earned only 4% return or earning of 4%. And there is another that has earned only 2%. Are they in ratio scale? Yes. We can say that A has earned 6 times more than C. While A has earned 3 times more than B. <coughs> Sorry. Now this calculation cannot be done. Cannot be done for something that I am going to discuss now. Now, if I try to do this calculation for, let's say, today, Lahore's temperature. Lahore's temperature is, let's say, <coughs> uh, 20 degrees centigrade. While Frankfurt had uh, temperature of 5 degrees centigrade. Can I say that the heat in Lahore is four times more than Frankfurt? I cannot. Why? Because the scale starts from minus 272. When we say that temperature is 0 degree centigrade, we are not saying that there is zero heat. So in case of temperature, 20 degree centigrade does not mean that the heat at this place is four times than heat of Frankfurt. The way temperature is measured, when we say temperature is zero, we are not actually saying heat is zero. Even at zero temperature, there is still some heat. That's how we go to minus 10 or minus 20. So even at zero, there is some heat. So then why we say zero? Just that the scale they have selected says it is zero. It should not be zero. But anyway, key thing from example point of view for UCFL level one is that temperature is a special case of scaling, which is called interval scale. Key thing is you cannot just use the ratio to identify the heat. Lahore 20 degrees centigrade, Frankfurt 5 degrees centigrade does not mean that Lahore has four times more heat than Frankfurt. Why? Because as you can see here, clearly written, zero does not mean total absence. So for example, zero degree centigrade does not mean total absence of heat. I cannot think of any other uh, scaling um, that would be uh, uh, fitting in into interval scale that you will come across. I think temperature is the only one. So it's very, very um, easy. Mostly it will be ratio scale if you can use, cal if you can do calculation. If you cannot do calculation, then either it will be ordinal or nominal scale. For example, uh, 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 bird, beautiful birds versus birds that cannot fly. Now, can you do any calculation? Can you say they are twice better? No, you cannot. So they are definitely not ratio scale. They're not even ordinal scale because you cannot even order. Forget about the calculation. You cannot say A, B, you cannot order them. 
um, so this was topic of measurement scale. Now we move to how data is organized, creating a frequency distribution. What is that? Frequency distribution is a way of organizing data. For example, uh, I'm going to ask you a question and based on that I'm going to collect data. Uh, I want to measure, measure your age and I want to organize it in a table. Um, so what I can do is I can ask you individually, I can get 20 set 20 people with their age, but that's not useful. That's not meaningful. That's not uh, what, what I can help me in doing the calculation that I want to do. It is better to organize you, your age into groups. Let's start with the groups. Obviously, there is no point in selecting group 0 to 10. I, uh, obviously. So, intervals or the groups that I am going to create, interval is another word for group. The groups that I am going to create or interval that I am going to create of age should be somewhat realistic. So, anyone who is less than 20 here? No. Right. So, my first group will be those who are 20 to 25 in terms of age. So, this is, this is the, uh, in a way defining group as well I can say the, the, the interval, the range. So kindly raise your hand if your age is between 20 and 25. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Now 13, I, I, I'll dot uh, because I will do, do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So this is the way data is recorded and also if you, if you see someone scoring and doing a match, this is the way 13 is recorded. Uh, this is another way of, of simply uh, making sure that you do not make mistake. So I could have just done 13 ticks but then there are chances of making mistake and difficult to read. This set is of 5 plus 5 plus 3. So we have 13 students out of 20 who are below 25. Let's create another group and that is 25 to uh, 30. How many of you are within this age bracket? 1, 2, 3, 3. Okay, so we have 1, 2, 3. Those who are 30 to 35, 1. Okay, we have one observation. Right, so this is how we, we uh, get uh, the uh, data organized. Now I'm going to convert into table. All I'm going to do is I'm going to write this number. So I'm going to write 13 here, I'm going to write 3 here one here. Now you must be thinking why I'm doing it in two steps, I could not simply write numbers. That's the way it is done to, to uh, uh, avoid errors. But anyway, now this is no more relevant, uh, uh, this is no more relevant. What we needed was these two columns. We have the column that we needed, this is the column that we need, and this is the column that we need. Now comes the frequency or how many observations are there. As you can see, which age group has highest frequency? The first age group, because the number of observation is 13. Now, that can be presented in terms of uh, percentage. I can say the 13 is out of total, the, the data that we've got is 17. So 13 out of 17 can be expressed in percentage. If we do that, that is called a relative frequency. So this is absolute frequency, just 13. Relative frequency will be 13 divided by 17 to get to give you to give you idea what percentage of the total lies in that. Now there is something else. For example, if I ask you how many are 30 or of 30 years or less, if I ask you the question that how many candidates are of 30 years or less, now what it requires you is uh, to add these two numbers, right? Because Candidates of 30 years or less would include both groups. Uh, so 3 plus 13 would be 16. Now this type of analysis is so much needed that generally table providers create another table, sorry, another, another column uh, uh, adjacent to this, the third column, in which they will present cumulative numbers. So you see here the accumulation has already been done. So that will save your time. You do not have to add numbers 3, 13 plus 3, that has already been done. So this is known as cumulative frequency. Now within this, if you just give me numbers, for example, for second group, 16 is what? It's a cumulative absolute uh, frequency. Why absolute? Because we are not expressing in percentage. But if you divide this 16 by 17, 
then what you get is called cumulative relative frequency because you are getting it in percentage. So make sure that you understand these uh, 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 here you have cumulative absolute frequency and cumulative relative frequency. This is in percentage. So 16 was cumulative absolute. And 16 divided by 17 would be cumulative relative frequency. Now I'm moving to the next page. Data can be organized in terms of uh, uh, diagrams and these diagrams have their names, uh, histogram and, uh, and polygon. The way this is created is you uh, uh, identify uh, groups. So let's say this is uh, first group, second group and third group and uh, here you have frequency, how many? Clearly you can understand if I represent it as a bar, this will be the, the highest because this will be representing 13. Then for the second category, I will have a small bar, small pillar, three. And then for the third category, I will have only a very small one. So basically this is 25, uh, 20 to 25. This is 25 to 30. And this is 30 plus. This is known as, as histogram, just a bar chart. So this is, these are bars, the bars. And then if I join the midpoints of these bars, uh, this is known as polygon. Now we had a very different type of data. Generally, generally you get uh, data organized like this. Uh, you will have a sh short bar, then you will have a lengthy bar, then you will have a lengthy bar, then you will have a short bar. For example, when we are going to conduct a test and your scores will be organized in terms of uh, low scorer, average scorer, uh, medium scorer, higher scorer, very high scorer, generally we observe this type of pattern. Very few students score very bad and very few students score very high. Mostly students are in mid. Uh, and then if you join the midpoints, you get something like uh, uh, this. This is mostly observed normally observed. Lot of time we want to measure the central tendency. For example, if we want to know uh, how are Pakistanis doing versus the Chinese. Now, obviously, ideally we should measure happiness, but unfortunately it's not easy or it's not practical to measure happiness. Basically, let's say the question is, how Pakistan are doing now, Pakistanis are doing now relative to Chinese, and how they were doing in 1983, 30 years back. We want to answer this question with data, not with, with our feelings. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether you have read, uh, there used to be uh, uh, Safar Namas of Pakistanis visiting China and coming back and saying that they all dress in the same thing, they all ride cycles, they all ride cycles, they all uh, drink just hot water um, and they were presented as, uh, as very good people. That anyway. Question is how we do that? How we look at how Pakistanis are doing versus Chinese? These days, the standard measure is something called GDP. Value of the production that we produce as a country. Um, or we can look at the wealth, how much wealth we have. Question is, should we compare the top Pakistani with the top Chinese? That won't be comparing average Pakistani with the average Chinese. That will be comparing the richest Pakistani with the richest Chinese. So we need to have some way of identifying some average guy, average Pakistani, and compare it to average Chinese. How we should do that? Well, we can look at uh, what we can say, average wealth of Pakistanis, which is total wealth of Pakistan, by the number of Pakistanis, will be average wealth and compared to average uh, Chinese wealth. There is a problem with that. This average will be biased. Why? Because you have Mia Mancha who has more than $2 billion. 
Now, few people like him will push the average up. So, they are, they, in fact, sometimes just getting to the average number is, is difficult. There are various ways to do that. This trying to find the average is called trying to find the measure of central tendency. What is the central tendency of f any data? There are various ways to do that. Uh, mean is one. Mean is simple average which should not be valid here in case of wealth because mean will be biased towards the wealthiness. Now you know the second highest number of billionaires in the world are is in China. After US, the highest number of billionaires in dollars um, is in China. So average wealth will be too high. So, so mean won't work. Mean is not appropriate. Why? Because it is... Uh, 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 the problem is, the shortcoming is, it is affected by extremely large and small values. So what we should do is, what we should use is called median. What is median? We should organize Pakistanis from uh, number 1 to 18th crore in terms of their wealth. So we start with the most poor and we organize to the most rich. In uh, Excel, we can do that, name and the wealth. And then we go in this list right in the mid. We look at ninth crore Pakistani and look at his wealth. And that would represent the level of wealth that is called median. Why? In the middle. Half of Pakistanis have wealth that is more than that. And half of Pakistanis have wealth that is less than that. So whenever we want to talk about in terms of wealth, we generally go with median. Median is... The, for example, in US, make a guess. What would be the median income? Let's talk about wealth. Wealth is a complex phenomenon. Income, as annual income of a median person. Now, in US, you have more than 300 million people. Uh, so, let's say you go to 150th million person and you want to know how much is his annual income. Um, and that person represents, his, his income represents someone in the middle. Half of Americans earn less than him, and half of Americans earn more than him. Make a guess. Forty thousand. Forty thousand dollars a year. Ten. Twenty-five. Forty-five. Okay, so you are getting the point that it won't be affected by how much Bill Gates is making, or how much Warren Buffett is making, or how much some some uh, uh, basketball player is making. It will be purely a function of uh, 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 everyone, basically. So on, at, on the middle, the guy in the middle is making how much? It is already down the percent Okay, midpoint of arranged distribution. So you divide it into two equal halves. The key thing is from exam point of view, it is not affected by extreme values. So clearly, the median, the middle guy's wealth will not be affected by Bill Gates making a couple of more billion dollars or losing a couple of billion dollars. But if we are calculating the average, the mean, then that would be affected. So mean is not useful. Median is. Would you like to know the, the mean hours spent by CFA candidates or median hours spent by CFA candidates in preparing for the exam? Which one is more relevant? If let's say you want to compare how you are doing, would you like to know the mean hour spent or the median hour spent? Median hour spent, because there can be crazy people who study 20 hours a day, and that would skew the, 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 the average too high. Or there can be some really uh, uh, well finan good uh, financial analysts who know this stuff so much that they have to spend only 10 hours, 20 hours, and they can pass the exam because they are doing it as part of their job. So these, these, these are all outliers, extreme values either too low or too high. And these both affect the mean. And these both do not affect the median. Very important from exam point of view. There is something else, and that is the mode. Now, what is the mode number of wives that Pakistanis have? Take care. Don't rush. It's a tricky question. Not mean, not median, the mode. One. One. That's wrong. It's zero because 60% of Pakistanis are below 25 and most likely they are not married. You jumped. You assume that I'm talking about 
married Pakistanis. I did not say what is that, what is the mode or number of wives of married Pakistanis. I did not say that. I simply said what is the mode number of wives of Pakistanis. Because 60% of our population is below 25, so I'm pretty sure that the, the mode is zero. Mode is the so in Pakistan, number of wives zero, one, two, probably three, probably if you go to some some remote areas uh, in in Cholistan somewhere. But clearly the mode is zero. Why? Because that is the most occurred observation. So mode is the most occurred observation. Make a guess. In US, number of cars for every household. What is the mode number of cars? Not median, not mean. Mode number of cars in uh, per house. Most number of cars per house. Per household, per house. US. I'm not talking about UK or France or Germany. US. See? Now that is important information for those who are marketing car care products. Because if more number of cars is two, that means you should market your car care for example, car polish, for example, other, other products in sets of two at a discounted price because most people are going to buy it because they have two cars. But on the other side, if most people have one car, then trying to sell your products in sets won't work because they'll say we are not interested, we have only one car, we need only one, one polish. This is a very important piece of information, but not in finance. In finance, most people work with median, uh, rarely with, with mode. In US, uh, the mode number of cars is, is one, uh, and that is uh, uh, recently changed. It used to be two, but now it is one because of uh, 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 less number of people getting married, uh, and because of that, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, household formation is, is getting slowed. Uh, it used to be two earlier. Anyway, uh, so this is, this is how we, uh, we learn about data, the, uh, the mean or the median or the mode. Okay, so now let's. Now this is a very interesting uh, finance-related mean. Most of you probably have not come across this. So let's do an example to uh, to to understand how how many it means. Let's say you get convinced that stocks are good investment, and you decide to invest in money in stock. The best way to do that this is a very simple formula for young people like you, uh, below 25. I would give any everything that I have to be at your position, to be young at that age. Uh, obviously, I cannot do that. There is no, no program for that. But if I was you, and I, if I go back at your age, I'll start doing something. And that is, start investing in stock every month. From first salary, start investing 10% of your money in stocks and do that every month. For 10 years, by the time you reach my age, you'll be a wealthy person. It's a very simple formula. Just 10%, not more than that. And do not think of selling the stock. It is only about buying. Buy, buy, buy. Do it for 10 years, you'll be a rich person. Later on, we, will, we can even go into calculation. The average return of our stock market for the last 10 years, and you can understand that, that, that. I know many people who have been doing this, and they've built a nice uh, retirement uh, fund before they are 40. Invest everyone. Let's say you can get convinced. You decide to invest. Now, which stock to invest in? Uh, well, we are an agricultural country. Let's say you go, uh, to go you know that uh, people will always be buying fertilizer. So you go with fertilizer. Which fertilizer? Well, you all know that Fauci's are never going to lose money in Pakistan. Obviously, this country has certain privileges that uh, for, for Fauci. So you go with Fauci fertilizer. Okay, you decide to invest every month from your salary X amount of money in Fauci fertilizer stock. The data is, let's say you invested um, 20,000 rupees in month one. So it is in rupees. In month one, you invested 20,000. In month two, uh, you, uh, you were able to again invest 20,000. And in the third month, you were again able to invest 20,000. However, uh, the share price, the price was not same every month. In the first month, the price was 40 rupees per share. In the second month, the price was 48, because of which obviously the number of shares that you purchased went down. In the third month, the price went up to 72. Obviously, the number of shares that you purchased will be different every year, every month. What we can do is you can simply divide 20,000 by the price to get number of shares. So let's do that. So 20,000 divided by 40. How many shares were purchased in month one? 
500. In the second month, 20,000 divided by 48. 416. Okay, and the last month, the price went up, so the number of shares must come down. To double seven. And the total number of shares, 1192. So our total investment of 60,000 help us in buying 1192 shares. So we can calculate the average cost. The average cost for us was what? So 60,000 divided by 1192. 50? 50.33. Now this could have been calculated quickly using this formula. All you have to do is 3 is the number of times it was done, 3 is the number of years. By the way, this formula will work if equal amount is invested every month. All you have to do is 1 by 40 plus 1 by 48 plus 1 by 72. And you will get, let's see what you get. So type 40 in your calculator, press 1 over x. And then store it in memory. Do you know how to store it in memory? Let's do that. Your calculator has 10 memories. You are free to use any of those 10 memories. Let's start using the first memory. So what you're going to do is uh, type 40 and then press 1 over x to do 1 over x. Now you have a number that you want to store in a memory. There is a key on the left side lower area, STO, short for store. So press store and then press 1, digit 1. Basically what you have done is, okay, now just clear, clear your calculator, press C, clear. Now there is a key RCL. So press RCL and press 1. So what you have done is, you have first stored the number to memory number 1. And now you are recalling memory number 1. So you just recall memory number 1. Okay, second step is 48. Type 48 and 1 over x. Now you would like it to be added to what is already stored in memory number one. Now, if you, if you should not do that, but if you do store one, then actually you're not adding it to the memory version number one. You are re replacing, you are uh, deleting the old and bringing it, uh, this new one there. No, you are not going to do that. What you're going to do is, you're going to press store, then you're going to press plus, and then you're going to press one. Store plus one, okay? Now recall one. As you will see, the number has gone up. Recall 1 is, is the sum of the two numbers. Now let's do the, with the third one. 72, 1 over x. And then store plus 1. Right? If you recall 1, what you have is the denominator of this. All you have to do is, you have to type 3, divide by, recall 1. 3, divide by, recall 1. 50.33. So here you have harmonic mean. Harmonic mean can be used in this type of situation to directly get the number 50.33 without going through this uh, calculation of number of shapes. Geometric mean is something that we discussed uh, uh, in the previous lectures. So geometric mean, when we were talking about time weighted return, we did discuss how to calculate geometric mean. What is new for you is uh, weighted mean. Now to give an example of that, let's say, let's say uh, uh, my portfolio consists of OGDC, OGDC and NBP. During the year, the return, or uh, for return, the percentage gain in OGDC was let's say 20%. And NBP, let's say return was 40%. What is my portfolio return? Portfolio return. Uh, now portfolio return, which we represent by return of the portfolio, RP, is what? 
Now it is quite tempting to say that the return of the portfolio, portfolio is a set of investment. I have invested in this two shares, oil and gas and National Bank of Pakistan. So these are two shares that I have invested. This year was great year, let's say, for banking. And banking, the NDP went up by 40%. Oil and gas went up by 20%. Only. So what is my average return? It is quite tempting to just add these two and divide by two and give a number of 30%. That on average, return was 30%. That would have been the case if my money is equally invested in these two shares. What if I, what if I provide you this information that the money invested, let's say I invested 80,000 rupees in OGDC and I invested uh, 40,000 rupees in National Bank. Now, what we are going to calculate is what is called weighted average mean. The way it will be done is, you have basically what you can do, 20% multiplied by 80,000 divided by 120,000. Where I get 120,000, that is 80,000 plus 40,000. So this, plus 40% into 30,000 divide by 120,000. So basically what I'm doing is, I'm not giving 20 and 40 equal weight. I'm giving more weight to 20%, as you can see. 20 will be multiplied by point roughly, what? Uh, six, seven? 20 is being given more weight. Why? Because more money is invested in OGDC. So what do we get? What is the answer? 20% plus the... 40 was the, what is the answer? 26.6? This is known as weighted average. <coughs> It will be there in exam. Weighted average mean will be there because whenever we talk about portfolio, we calculate weighted average mean. This will be in equities, will be in portfolio management, it will appear so many times that I can be pretty sure that you will be doing one or two question in exam calculating weighted average mean. Make sure that you can do that. Weighted mean. Geometric mean. And this one that we are familiar with where we just add and divide by n is known as which mean? Arithmetic mean, very good. This one is known as arithmetic mean. So we have learned various types of, of uh, means, arithmetic, weighted, and geometric, and harmonic. Did we study harmonic median? No. Did we study geometric median? No. By the way, from exam point of view, you need to remember a relationship between this and arithmetic mean. Geometric mean will always be less than arithmetic mean. Like it can be okay, equal to or less. If there is only one observation, then it is equal, but most it is less. Quantiles. Now, I play a game whenever I get time, uh, that does not require moving anything except fingers. I do not have to go out and, and do something. I just play around computers. Uh, the website is known as Lumosity. L-U-M-O-S-I-T-Y. Uh, uh, these are brain games and uh, generally game, when you play a game, you feel a bit ashamed because you are wasting time. But when the, the game provider convinces you that by playing these games, you will be more intelligent and more sharp, I uh, do not feel ashamed to play that. So I, I play those games and I feel as, as if I'm not wasting time. Interesting thing, uh, there is a link which says how you compare. So I go on that and click on that and they provide me that I'm on 98th percentile. And I can assure you that it's a good thing. 
98th percentile in the world. 50 million people. 50 million people play that game and I am 98th percentile. What does that mean? Basically it means that uh, if they rank people in terms of uh, their ability to score, I am better than 98%. Interestingly, it is not because of how intelligent I am. Not, nothing, absolutely nothing. Even if I do not play, every week my position improves. Even if I have not played a single game. Can you guess what is going on? Those who are joining that, they are not playing that well. So relatively, I am I'm, I'm better than, than, than others. So I am improving. Probably if things go the way they are, when they will have 1 billion users like Facebook, probably I will be 99th percent there. Just because other people who are joining, they are new, they have not played that much. When I saw playing, by that time I was good in playing. So, key thing is, 98th percentile. Now, that's not the only way to present data. Uh, I could have said that I am 9th decide. If I had said 9th decide, what does that mean? I am better than 90%. 1 decide is 10%. 2 decide 20%, 3 decide 30%. This way, 9 decide is 90%. Or I could have said that I am I am at third quartile, quartile, quarter, quarter and quartile, third quartile. So you start from zero. First quarter is 25%, second quarter is 50%, third quarter is 75%. So this way there can be various uh, ways data can be organized. We have few here. We have percentile that discussed, decide. Quartile and then a bit strange, quintile. Quintile is for 20%. So where you are dividing 100 into 5 parts, each of 20%. So if I am 4th quintile, my performance is that I am at 4th quintile, that means that I am better than 80%. Now, if we go with the historical pass rates, you need to be aware to pass CFA level 1 exam. In percentile. No, no, that is the percentage score that you need to get. But of students, of all students appearing in June in the world, you should be better at the end, you should be at what percentile that you will improve your, that will show that most likely you will pass. If, 70, 70. No, no. Pass rates are around 33%. Okay, let me give the data. Pass rate is around 32%, 33%. 33 so if pass rate is 33%, what does that mean? That of all 100 students appearing, top 33 are able to pass the exam. You need to be at what percentile? 67th percentile. Because if you are at 67th percentile, that means you are better than 67th percent and you belong to that 33%. By the way, if you have uh, time, do explore that luminosity. It's a, it's a very interesting, uh, it does help. Uh, you have to play 10 to 15 minutes every day, and if you do it for three weeks, which you can do it for free if you have iPhone or, or something like that. So there it is, there the free, it's not that expensive. Probably one month is free just for signing up. Uh, that helps. It helped me at least. Uh, now this. is what I have already discussed. Geometric mean will be less than arithmetic mean. Now, for values that are not all equal, if they are all equal, then these all three will be same. So if they are non-equal, for example, 40, 48, and 72, or something like this, if they are not equal, then we have this relationship. And further extended, harmonic mean will be even less than this. Anyway, here comes a formula. And the question is why we have this formula. The way it is going to be examined is, it's a very interesting way you will be examined on this. The way you will be examined on this is, uh, let's say there are 4,341 fund managers. They are managing funds. And every year they are reporting results. They are reporting that this is what we have earned. Uh, you want to know the performance of fund manager 
that is 72nd percentile so you want to know the performance of the manager who is better than 72 percent 72 percentile how you're going to do that which manager out of these 4341 managers which manager so should you look at 1000th clearly 1000th is not some better than 72 percent what about 2000 what about 2200 no better is using this formula n would be the number of managers y would be 72 the percentile for which we are looking for so using this we can find out which manager is at 72 percentile which manager's performance is better than 72 percent so let's do this so 4341 plus 1 into 72 divided by 100 comes to sorry 3 3, 1, 2, 6. Now we know that the performance of 3,126 managers, we need to organize all managers from the worst performing to the best performing, and the performance of 3,126 manager represent uh, uh, performance that is better than 72%. So this is how we use this formula for calculating specific number, specific position. This formula is used to identify a specific position. Let's take a break. We'll continue at 7.20. Thanks. Okay. Let's say there are two fund managers, Tom and Lee. The average return of Tom is 12%. While the average return for Lee is 15%. Now, if you just look at the average return or the mean return, you'll say Lee is better than Tom. But if you look at historic data and it turns out that Tom is been earning these type of returns of which average comes to my to 12 percent while Lee's returns have been So for different years, for year number one, year number two, year number three, year number four, year number five, we have data. In one year, Tom lost uh, the worst year, 20%. Then there was a loss of 5%. Then there was a gain of 12%, gain of 15%, 25%. On average, let's say it comes to 12%. On the other side, Lee had a worst year in which loss was 70%. And the best year was when the gain was 170%. Now, this 15% is not looking that good compared to 12. If you have to choose which manager you want to invest with, yes, Lee is offering you 15% average return, but then you should be prepared to lose even 70% in one given year. As you can see, we can say that the dispersion or the spread of uh, returns of Lee is much more than dispersion for Tom. So not only we are interested in knowing the average return, we are also interested in knowing the dispersion of return. There are various ways to do that. The dispersion, there are various ways to measure that. One is called mean absolute deviation. What you do in this, for each observation, this sigma refers to that you should do it for each observation and then add. 
Sigma means two things. Do it for each observation and then add all those numbers. Each observation minus the average. And then these vertical lines require it to, uh, to make it absolute, which ignore the sign and add. Because if you do not ignore the sign, then positive and negatives will cancel out. So basically, if you, if you look at this, what we are doing, for each observation, we are looking at how much is the gap between that observation and the average number. Now you think of 170 minus 15. This huge gap, huge deviation. So this is the way we calculate mean absolute deviation. There is another way to calculate the average or mean deviation. which is called standard deviation. So you can either calculate mean deviation, mean absolute deviation or standard deviation. In standard deviation, we are doing the same thing, every observation minus the average and then instead of taking the absolute number, we square it. You know when a number is squared, then positive, negative turns into positive. Then we divide by n minus 1. If it is a sample, we divide by n minus 1. If it is the whole population, then we divide it by n and we take a square root. Regardless of which one you use, mean, absolute deviation or standard deviation, actually what we are getting is sort of average deviation from the mean. How, on average, how much is the return higher or lower than the mean? Uh, we are not going to technicalities of the, the uh, merits of uh, just using the absolute numbers versus taking square and then taking square root. Theoretically speaking, you can understand that if you take a square, you add and then take square root, actually you are not doing anything, you are just cancelling out. So, but we are not going to detail of that, just remember that uh, uh, you can either use the standard deviation or you can use the mean deviation. If you do not take the square root, then it is called variance. Now this is high school mathematics, I am quite sure that not new for you. Then there is a range. Range is the maximum minus the minimum. Maximum minus the minimum is just the range. Obviously, you would like these numbers to be low, whether it is mean deviation, whether it is standard deviation, whether it is variance, whether it is range. The lower these numbers are, more precision or accuracy. The manager is more precise, the manager is more accurate. The lower these numbers are, that indicates precise, the precision is very, is consistently able to earn a return close to a number. Whether that number is good or bad, that is a separate thing because it can happen that let's say a manager has standard deviation of zero, which means no deviation. He always earns the same return every year and the average return of that manager is minus 4%. Is he a good manager, money manager? No. Yes, he has no deviation, but he is earning, losing money every year. So standard deviation is obviously interpretable, meaningful, once you know the mean. So whenever, for example, a, a manager says that I have earned, my average return is, let's say, 20% positive, that's a good return, as long as the deviation, historically, has not been much. So if he historically has been able to earn around 2018, 20, 21, 22, then we'll say that's, that's a good return. So dispersion is measured either by mean, using mean, or standard, or variance, or range. Now, one very interesting point from exam point of view that you need to remember. If you want to add dispersion of various things, you have to use variance. You cannot add standard deviations. Let me be very clear. If you want to add two deviations, it should be variance. You cannot add uh, standard deviations. So if it is a whole population, then you'll be using n in the denominator. You should not use n if it is a sample, rather you should use n minus 1. There is a reason given why. Uh, because if you use n for sample, you will get something called biased estimator. All that you need to know. Do not go in detail of that. Just remember that if it is a sample data and instead of using n minus 1, you use n, you will get a biased estimator. Or in, not say incorrect, but biased is sort of incorrect uh, estimator. 
population standard deviation is same as population variance, the square root of that would give you uh, the population standard deviation. Mostly, you'll be working with the uh, sample. So most likely, you'll be using n minus 1 to calculate standard deviation. In exam, you'll require the data and you'll be required to calculate standard deviation and you will have answer based on n as well as n minus 1. So make sure that you read the statement correctly, whether the statement data is of a sample or data is of a population. But otherwise, it's very straightforward. Now, from exam point of view, I think more likely is you won't be tested on standard deviation. Rather, you'll be tested on something else that is more uh, high level, that is more, uh, what I should say, how to put it, more uh, useful. As a financial analyst in my life, something that is more useful. Now, it's very common for people to look at the standard deviation or average deviation of various investments. Let's say there are uh, two investments available, investment A and investment B. In fact, I was teaching the other day in, fix, uh, in level 3, the same topic. Uh, there were two investment choices available and students had to recommend which one is, is better. Now, A had a standard deviation of 1.5 percentage point while uh, B had a standard deviation of 2.5 percentage point. Clearly, it looks like B is more risky. The story was something like this, that there was a fund manager who was required to earn a um, certain return, and he had to choose between A or B. Obviously, his objective was to reduce risk. B looks risky. Why B looks risky? Because 2.5 percent standard deviation, which is more than A. However, once we looked at the average return, the mean return, um, for A, average return had been 10%, while for B, average return had been 20%. That changes the picture. Why? Because what we are saying that B has a standard deviation of 2.5. On average, the return will be higher or lower compared to mean. So either will go up or go down by 2.5% on average. Okay, it's go, it goes down by 2.5%. Then what? Still it is 17.5. But in this case, if it is goes down by 1.5, then it is only 8.5. Yes, B has fluctuation. But even after fluctuation, the bad return is still 17.5. A has, does not have that much fluctuation, but even with the, okay, let's go with the positive fluctuation, even with the positive fluctuation, it will generate only 11.5, because on average fluctuation is of 1.5. So basically for us to conclude which fund is more risky, uh, we should take a ratio of these two. Here you have coefficient of variation, which is simply a ratio of these two. Standard deviation divided by the mean gives us coefficient of variation. Let's do that for, for our data. So 2.5 divided by 20 versus 1.5 divided by 10. As you can see, in terms of percentage, this is 15%. And this is 12.5%. So this is less risky. Despite having higher standard deviation, it is less risky because it has lower coefficient of variation. The ratio of dispersion to the mean. Now as you can understand, Okay, let's go this, do this. A relative dispersion, amount of variability relative to a reference point. So standard deviation is a relative dispersion or coefficient of variation is a relative dispersion. Amount of variation or dispersion relative to a reference point. What would be coefficient of variation? Coefficient of variation is a relative dispersion. Because we are saying variation with reference to the mean. Another topic that regularly appears in exam is this, a ratio. 
This ratio has three numbers. You will be most likely provided with these numbers. All you have to do is make sure that you know what to do with these numbers and you'll get the answer. This number is called return of the portfolio and the, the bar at the top indicates the average return of a portfolio. So over the last lesson three years, this portfolio has provided us a return of this much. So average return of the portfolio over the last three years. Second number is RF, risk-free rate, the rate that government offers. Clearly, when you deduct this risk-free rate from the portfolio return, what you get is the extra return that portfolio provides over government investment. And then you divide it by the standard deviation of the portfolio. Now, this is the risk that portfolio is providing. And this is the reward or the return. So this is also known as, sharp ratio is also known as reward to risk ratio. In the denominator, you have risk of the portfolio. In the numerator, you have the excess return of the portfolio. Now I'm going to make a statement and you need to identify correct or incorrect. Sharp ratio is a ratio of return of portfolio to risk of portfolio. Correct or incorrect? Sharp ratio is the ratio of return of the portfolio to the risk of the portfolio. This is incorrect. Let's try another one. Sharp ratio is the ratio of excess return of a portfolio to excess risk of a portfolio. Well, it, it looks like false, but it is correct. Actually, why? Because the, though it's not mentioned here, but the exact formula is minus risk of the risk-free investment. But because risk of the risk-free investment is zero, so that's why we have only uh, risk of the portfolio. So denominator is the risk of the portfolio, which can also be called the, uh, the excessive risk of the portfolio, given that government has no risk. But this cannot be used for the numerator. The return of the portfolio is not the excessive return of the portfolio. Return of the portfolio minus the risk-free rate is the excessive return of the, of the portfolio or excess return of the portfolio. But anyway, these are the type of tricks that you may come across in exam. Key thing is from, a, from investor perspective, the higher this ratio is, the better it is. Let's go to the last. Now mostly in real life, when we look at data, whether it is student scores, um, uh, whether it is uh, fund manager performance, when we tabulate the data, we get something like this. But it indicates, basically, we have bars and we have just joined the midpoint of those bars. Each bar is representing the number of observation for each group. So basically, this is what we have done is. So on x-axis, we have various groups and y-axis, we have their number, how many. And we have joined the midpoints and we have got that black curve. Or that's also known as bell curve because like inverted bell. So here you have frequency or how many. And here you have groups, various groups. Group number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 groups. Or I can instead of using on x axis 1, 2, 3, I can use the range. For example, age 0 to 3 year, 3 year to 6 year, 6 year to 9 year, 9 year to. Now, uh, this is what is observed in most of the cases. So that's why it's called normal distribution. Normally, this is the way it is. Now, uh, it is, this is also known as symmetrical. Why symmetrical? Because the idea is that the, if you cut it into half, then the left side is exactly same as the right side. Though my drawing skills do, are not good enough to indicate that, but that's the theory, that it is symmetrical. Now, another way I can, I can uh, uh, interpret that is that 50% data is on the left side of this peak and 50% is on the right side, which would make this point the median. Now, uh, 
This will also represent the mean and the mode. All three will be at exactly same point if it is symmetric. Let's think of age of Pakistani people. Let's try to draw. Here you have on x axis you have age groups. Uh, so first is up to three years, then three to six years, six to nine years, and this way you have all the way, you have all groups. Can you think of the shape of the of the uh, uh, bars? higher in the start and will, will gradually fall. So if you if I join their top points, it will be something like uh, something like this. Now as you can see, it is not symmetrical because if I cut it from the mid, from the peak, this is the peak, if I cut it like this, the right side is not same as the left side. So this is non-symmetrical because both sides are not equal. In fact, this could have been like this. This is known as problem of skewness. When two sides are not equal, then we say that the say there is a skewness problem. This one is known as negatively skewed and this one is known as positively skewed. How to remember if you remember, know the basis of graphs? This is the negative region, this is the positive region. So if the leg, this is the leg, the long leg. Leg is on the negative side, then it is negatively skewed. If the leg is on the positive side, then it is positively skewed. So you can remember another way. Pakistan's population uh, distribution is positively skewed. You have a long leg on positive side. Um, this is... Now, by the way, when there is symmetry, all three are at the same place, median, mean, and mode. They are at the same, the peak. But in this case, the mode is easy. This is mode. How I know that? Because it's peak, highest one. So where is the mean and where is the median? Now, the way to remember is, I was taught in high school, that mean is mean. Mean is, mean will move to the side where the long leg is. Here, long leg is here, so mean would move here. In this case, mean would move here. And median will always be in the mid of these two. Median. This is mode. The peak is mode. So let's, let's summarize. The peak is mode and the mean will move towards the longer leg and the median will be in between of these two. That brings us to this. Negatively skewed. You have negatively skewed. Mode is the peak one. Mean moves towards the leg and median is in the mid. Mean is less than median, which is less than mode. Mean is less than median, which is less than mode. On the other side, if it is positively skewed, which means leg is on this side, mode is the peak, mean moves toward the positive side, and median is in the middle. Now, uh, mean is greater than median, which is greater than mode. Sometimes, there is a problem with the vertical movement keep in mind let's try this so this was normal distribution and then depending on whether this peak moved on the right or on the left we were able to identify negatively skewed versus positively skewed sometimes the problem is of vertical movement this is known as problem of you know what is the most vertically important thing in pakistan height if you think of height in Pakistan, what comes to your mind? Height in Pakistan. There should be one word. Now, inflation? No, no, height. Not, not. K2. Yeah, K2. 
So kurtosis. This problem is known as kurtosis. Kurtosis is a problem of height of the distribution. Sometimes there is too much height, sometimes there is too less height. And that is problem of kurtosis. You have to do these type of things to remember that in exam under stress, generally students make mistake not because they do not know, rather they get confused and they are not able to um, recall. So these type of mnemonics help in remembering. Kurtosis is a problem of vertical height. Now, from exam point of view, you need to remember few facts. For a normal distribution, the skewness is zero. And kurtosis, the vertical height, is three. This is normal. So if an exam it says that a distribution has skewness and kurtosis of zero, is it normal? No. That's abnormal. Because normal is skewness should be zero and kurtosis should be three. Exam, this is interesting. Now there is something called excess kurtosis, which is kurtosis above three. So let's say a distribution has kurtosis of kurtosis of two. What is the excess kurtosis of this distribution? The excess kurtosis would be negative one. Excess kurtosis in this case is negative one because it is one less than what it should be. So it's a negative one. On the other side, let's say a distribution has kurtosis, kurtosis again, kurtosis, kurtosis of five. What is the excess kurtosis? Positive two. There are formula to calculate skewness and kurtosis given here. I do not recommend remembering this. If you want to, you can, but uh, it's unlikely. However, you need to remember this that if excess kurtosis is negative, if excess kurtosis is negative, let me repeat again and again. I am not saying if kurtosis is negative. What I am saying is if excess kurtosis is negative, then this is known as platical tick. If excess kurtosis is greater than zero, which means positive one or positive two, then it is called leptokurtic. Let's try to organize it. Let's say I'm, I'm making a column for kurtosis. What would be here? Leptokurtic is where kurtosis is. Kurtosis is? How much? Five or to generalize? Greater than three is equal to three is less than three. Why I am emphasizing this? Whereas in exam, this can be quite easily uh, uh, tricked. A lot of time, the question is talking about kurtosis, while student is understanding that it is talking about excess kurtosis or other variant. One way to remember is, uh, if this is normal distribution, and uh, this is the distribution that you are looking at, not even. Now there is yeah, another important exam fact. Uh, the black one has excess kurtosis that is negative. As you can see, if blue one is the normal, the black one is abnormal and has less peak. One way to remember is it is like inverted plate. Think of inverted plate, height won't be that much. So plate a tech, right? That's why it's called plate a -curtic. No, obviously not. But that's how, how you remember things. So if it is inverted. But then from exam point of view, you need to need note something. Uh, this section and this section is known as tails. The left tail and the right tail. The black distribution that I have, that I am presenting, is a platycurtic, but the tails, look at the tails. Black tails are more thick than blue tails. The blue tails would be up to here, right? 
but the black tails are in height more they are more in height so just know this fact that uh, it is possible that a distribution has less peak than normal distribution but may have fatal tails or may have thinner tail it can be like this so if you look at this is the normal distribution and you have a distribution like this then not only it is platycratic but it has also thinner tail why because the, the, the thickness of the black is less than the blue but if it is like this then it is still platycratic but the tails are now thicker than than the blue we'll talk about this when we'll talk about sampling in detail another fact from exam point of view if these things are there then risk goes up if we observe that the fund manager historical performance is indicating greater positive kurtosis and more negative skewness we dislike it we think there is much more risk we do not like negative skewness and we do not like positive kurtosis because both indicate higher risk so when we are investing we would like to have negative kurtosis and positive skewness that would indicate less risk I have not discussed Chebyshev's inequality. That's the last thing that I'm going to discuss. For some reason, we want to know how much area falls under, for example, this section. Is it 20% of the total? Is it 30%? Is it 40%? Chebyshev's inequality gives us a way to do that, to calculate. Chebyshev's inequality says that let's say this is this is where we are standing. This is our mean, mode, and median. It is symmetrical. So this is our mean. It says if you move around mean and you want to find this area, there is a formula for that. Let's look at the formula. it says that if you move around the mean k standard deviation then the area is at least this 1 minus 1 over k square what does that mean let's try let's say average return of a fund manager is 20% the standard deviation of the fund manager is 2.5 exam question can be how okay how many times observation will fall within the range of 15 to 25% in the last let's say 20 years how many how many times our observation will be within this range now you can see this range is actually 20 plus minus 5 i can also write 20 plus minus 2k where k is the number of standard deviation we know one standard deviation is of 2.5 so distance of 5 can be expressed as two standard deviation we can use chebyshev's inequality and it says if you move plus minus two standard deviations around the mean then at least 75% observation at least 75% observation will be within that range so we can say with confidence that this manager in last 20 years 75% of the time his return must have been within this range 
75 percent is the answer. You can use this table to get 75 percent or you can use this formula. Let's say use this formula. If we are moving two standard deviation, two standard deviation around the mean, then 1 minus 1 over 2 square is 0.75 or 75 percent. There are two ways to interpret this. One is 75 percent observation should be within this range. Or another way to say that is 75 percent area falls under this. Let's try another one. Let's say a fund manager's average return has been 30 percent. His standard deviation has been 3 percent. Of last 20 years, how many years his performance must have been within the range of 24 to 36 percent? He has been in business for 20 years. Using Chebyshev's inequality, you need to identify that for how many years he must have earned within this range. 75% of 20 years, which is 15 years. How we know that? Because this range, as you can see, is mean plus minus 6, right? 30 plus minus 6 which can also be represented as mean plus minus two standard deviations. By the way, we also use this for standard deviation. This is all standard deviation. Mean plus minus two standard deviation, that is 75%. 75% times he must have earned within this range. And because we have data for 20 years, 75% of that is 15 years. This is how we use Chebyshev's inequality. Obviously, this will not work as the formula suggests if standard deviation is less than 1. Now, if I had asked you to solve the same problem for a different range, let's say I ask you that average return is 30%, this is the mean return, and I want you to, and the standard deviation is 3%. And I want you to calculate how many times the data has fallen within this range. Now you can understand that this can be presented as mean plus minus 3, which can be presented as mean plus minus 1 standard deviation. Can we use Chebyshev inequality? No, we cannot. Why? Because it can be only used if k is greater than 1. This brings us to the end of the reading number 7.